And from this story in Genesis, we're going to gleam some great truths about husband and wife and relationships of, um, uh, within the married, married life. So here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So as we look at this incredible story about the creation of the wife, we learn a few important truths about marriage. Number one, and this is the most glaring truth of all, is that man was formed first. All right, that's the first thing that at least got my attention when I was a new believer is because I always thought that men and women were formed at the same time because I figured, you know, the chicken and the egg, how, how can you have one without the other? You know, you, you, you think this way, right? Well, biologically, we know men had to come first because they and they alone have both the X and Y chromosome, the male and female, while the woman has only the two X chromosome female. She only has female. So immediately, even biologically, you see that when uh, uh, Adam, male and female, were being formed, the man was formed first. Uh, the Apostle Paul affirms this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. He says, for Adam was formed first, then what does it say? Then Eve. All right? So who came first? Adam was formed first, then Eve. So we see, and, 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 uh, and this sets a pattern as to the authority within the home. In fact, the Apostle Paul alludes to this in, in the preceding verse where he says, I do not permit a wife, this, and the word woman should be translated wife, to teach or have authority over her husband. She must be silent, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. So he's saying that since the man came first, God intended for the man to be the leader in the home. All right? So that's the first principle I notice in this passage. The second thing that, that I get from this passage is woman, it's God's creation, not man's creation. How did God form the woman? What did he do to form a woman? He did what? He took, no, no, no. The first thing he did, we all say he took a rib, but he caused Adam to what? Fall into a deep sleep. Now, why is that? Well, you needed anesthesia because that was going to hurt to take a rib. Uh, but no, 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 more than that, there is a spiritual significance. What God is saying is, even though the woman has come after the man, the man is not her creator. He had nothing to do with it. How many of y'all know you can't create anything when you are in deep sleep? So what is he saying is, this woman is a creation of God and her highest allegiance will be to me, her creator, not to the husband. And people ask this question. Um, what if my husband tells me to do something that is against the Bible? Well, most husbands don't ever do that. But if that's the case, you already know your husband is not your God. He's not your creator. The creator is God himself. So do you see the principle here is by causing the man to fall into the deep sleep, God is showing significance that, she, that the woman, though she was formed after uh, the male, is nevertheless a creation of God. So when God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in the beginning God created um, Adam, male and female, he created them. What is he saying? Is God's the creation, the creator of everyone. All right? So he's the creator of every single soul. So this is what God does. He creates even the woman. So listen, ladies, you are not a creature or product of your husband or of the man. The man fell into a deep sleep. Therefore, he had nothing to do with your creation, except that God was going to take a rib from his side. That's the only thing.
So do you see the spiritual significance in this? The third significance that I notice in this passage is the woman was formed from the rib, which is the side, almost closest to the heart so that the wife standing will stand by his side equal to her husband. Now, where does he uh, get the bone from? Where does he, what does he use? He uses his side. In, uh, people have made a big deal about the Hebrew that it doesn't say rib necessarily, but it has the word of a curve item. So that's why people believe it to be a rib, and that's been the tradition. But that he took something from his side. Now, this is significant. By taking it from his side, he is saying that this woman is to stand by his side, not underneath his feet. For if God took a bone from the foot, then man could have interpreted that to say, I'm supposed to rule over my wife. If he took a bone from the head, then the wife could have interpreted that, said, I'm his boss. So listen to me. The woman that stands next to you is your equal. That's why 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, be considered to your wives as the weaker vessel and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. So what is she? She is an heir with you. She is not below you. Is she made as a weaker vessel because she came later? Yes, but she is an equal heir with you of the gracious gift of life. So by taking a bone from the side, God is showing the woman is equal and she's supposed to stand by his side. Also, it's close to the heart. The bone is close to the heart. In other words, man's greatest love is going to be this woman. And husbands, the greatest love you should ever have on this planet is toward your wife. No one should come even close to that love. Is This is what God is signifying by creating the woman from his side. But the fourth thing I notice about this is God did not... Notice, what did God do when he created the woman? Uh, let's look at... Um, Verse 22, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he, what did God do? And he brought her to the man, and the man said, now did God say, Adam, here's your wife. If he would have done this, it would have signified that God chooses our wives for us. But by bringing the wife to Adam, he is, he is signifying in this, that it is still up to each of us whether or not we want to get married. Marriage is not forced upon any person. Even though there may be someone compatible with you that would make you happy, you are not forced to get married. You don't have to get married. God did not tell Adam this is your wife. He just brings her to him and he sees what Adam will do. Will he accept her as his wife or not? It's still up to him. So choices of marriage is still ours. So you don't have to get married if you don't want. Some of you say, oh, that's a relief. But you don't have to. And it's still your choice. You can decide whether or not you want to get married. So God did not force Adam to marry her, but he did create her and brought her to the man. And, and that also tells us something. God will bring you your spouse if you really want him to. Thank you for that amen. Amen. Somehow, God's going to bring to you this, your spouse. And so, finding that special person is a miracle from God. It is God's action in our life. The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So, it, it is a miracle. God's the one who brings us the people. But it's up to us to choose. Now, what did Adam name this woman? The man said, this is verse... 23, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Woman is um, isha, and man is ish. In other words, it's basically a derivative of the same. So what Adam is saying is, she is a part of me. She is my other side. She is my other, we often say other half. Why do we say this? Because God created that person who is that other side to you, that side that helps complete you. So he, he, he made him 
a woman, and there's, there's something else that, that I don't think I, I brought out, and I should have, is when God took the rib, he did not replace the rib. Okay? When he took the rib out, he did not replace it. And the way it reads in the Hebrew is this side bented him. This is, the, this is the way if you could read Hebrew and made him limp as he got out, holding his side, knowing, in other words, he didn't come out fresh and not even feel anything. He came out with an emptiness. Are you with me now? Now, this is going to be significant because this is going to lead us to our next principle. Adam called her woman because God did not replace the rib but made it so that man needed his wife. Did you hear this? Now, for the woman, he created a whole woman with all 12 ribs. But the man had only 11, and he was incomplete without her. All right, so God is creating within the original man this desperate need to fill that missing part of him. And therefore, we're going to find out what is he going to do when he finds that missing part. Man, what did, what did the Bible say in verse 24? This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Literally, in the King James Version, Genesis 2.24, King James, it says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall, come on, help me out, cleave unto his wife. And that word cleave means to stick to to reach out, to grab hold of, to need, to want. I need you, baby. But it means more than just, I want you in, a, in the socket. I need you because I cannot be complete without you. And, and it literally means he stuck to her. And, and are you ready for this? And he has no desire to be unstuck from her. Because how can I get unstuck to the person who is my other half? So God created a desperate need in man so that he would be missing that other half and he would cleave to her. He would want her. He would need her more than anything on the planet. There would be nothing else on his mind that he needed more than her. This is the idea in Hebrew. That's why he's limping. And only when he joins with her can he walk straight. Because now I'm not missing anything. But before her, I'm hurting. I need you. This is the idea, cleaving, craving, needing you so badly. And God created man to want his wife more than anyone, and it has this idea to be stuck and never unstuck ever. This is the missing person. And then finally... Genesis 2.25, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And that brought, brings us to the final point here is sex between a spouse is holy. Now, did you get this? Sex between a spouse is holy. It is not simply nice and fun and needed for procreation. It is a holy thing because it says, and they felt no shame. The opposite of shame is sin. So it's God's way of saying it was a holy action between these two. But any action of sex 
that's not between a husband and wife is a shameful, unholy thing before God. Yeah. So this is the only sex that is holy and endorsed by God. But we live in an era where people don't appreciate that. They treat sex like it's a recreational activity instead of that thing that binds you and unites you into one flesh. So this was God's plan. And what, what, why am I reading this? What does this have to do with you guys? It's simple. Jesus said in Matthew 19, when he's teaching about marriage, he says, haven't you read that at the beginning, can you all say beginning? So what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, he says, some of you, you don't go back to the beginning to find God's plan. Instead, you look at after sin and what has happened to the human race, and then you decide, well, we should get, be able to get a divorce because after all, you know, uh, we all get upset and, we, and people hurt us and, and all this terrible stuff takes place, and so therefore I need to get out of this marriage. This, this guy's not making me happy. This woman has gotten, gotten, uh, gained weight, and I don't want none of this. And all of a sudden, you have all this thing in your mind. Yet Jesus said, you want to know God's plan? Go to the beginning. I don't change the plan because of sin. But now, this brings us to some brand new revelation. And that is, what's happened? Because as I look at what God did, and I look at humanity today, I don't see this. I don't see a man sticking with his wife, cleaving to her. Instead, I find a man who's distant, and the woman is trying to persuade him to be with her. When that should have never been. What's happened to the human race? Sin is what happened. And this is what we're going to see now, is the original sin did something in this relationship to distort it and twist it and not make it be the kind of thing God intended it to be. But while we look at what has happened because of sin, we must always be reminded Christ came to redeem us from sin and to set us back in the original order. And that's what Jesus was telling the people in Matthew 19. God has come to set you back in the original order and do not allow sin to change that original order. But sin definitely has done it. And listen to what happened at the original sin and how this twisted everything. The next verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat fruit from the tree, from any tree in the garden? Now stop for a moment, time out. What is the first thing I, I, I recognize in this? Can anybody tell me? God created Adam and he created the woman, Eve, right? And who does Satan attack? Attacks the woman. He's had Adam to attack, but he doesn't attack him, does he? He goes right after the woman because one thing Satan knows, he knows this woman, that this man loves her deeply like no other. So if I'm to get to the man, I'm going to get to the man through the woman. And also he recognized that though the woman was made in the image and likeness of God, she was also a weaker vessel. He saw that she wasn't to the same status and giftings as the man was. So what does he do? He goes after what he sees as the weaker link in this relationship. Now watch this. Verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Are you ready for this? Eve made three mistakes. When she, in this one sentence, she errs in three ways. She doesn't give the quotes properly to what God said. She's already erring in her confrontation with the serpent. 
First, she says, God says we must not eat from the tree that, what, what does she say? That is in the what? Middle of the garden. God never said that because there were two trees in the middle of the garden. One of the tree was the tree of life. How many of y'all know we better come to the tree of life? That's a tree for all of us. But then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Both trees were in the middle. She wasn't specific. She said we must not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Wrong. She, we must not eat fruit from the, knowledge, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not from any tree. She wasn't specific in her quotation and what she was specifically forbidden to do. Second thing, God never says anything that you must not touch it. He says you must not eat. Yet she says you must not touch it. What, why am I being specific in this? Because I'm trying to point out something that God intended her husband to lead the family in spiritual warfare and confrontation to the devil, that he was the one equipped for it, but instead we find the woman is trying to do something that the man should be doing. One of the great sins is when women try to do what men are called to do. You must let your husband do what he's called to do, and because the moment you try to do his job, we're in trouble. But the third mistake that, that Eve made is she said, you must not touch it or you will what? What does it say? You will what? Die. God didn't say you will die. He said you will surely die. And in Hebrew, the word surely is the same word for die. It says, and you will die, die. And she says, you will just die. Three mistakes in one short sentence. She gets it wrong. So I'm, I'm going to show you, this is all going to have ramification in, 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 as to the role of husband and wife. Now the serpent, what does he do? You will not certainly die. He, it, almost, he just corrects her. Even though she doesn't say you will certainly or surely die or die, die, the serpent says you will not die, die. That's the way the Hebrew reads. You won't die, die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. One joke says that Eve, after covering with fig leaves, she went on and tried maple leaves, and then she went on and tried, um, no, no, she went shopping for different leaves. But no, <laughs> they sewed fig leaves together. My wife likes that. She, <laughs> she went to the outlet to find some other leaves, which one looked best on her. But anyway. Then the, now, now watch this. We're going to see what happened. Uh, let, let me stop. Well, I'll tell you what. Let, let, let's keep going. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees. But the Lord called to who? The man. God respects authority. He respects who's the one who's supposed to be in charge. Watching The Bondage Breaker with Bishop Tom Brown. To receive today's message in its entirety, call us now, 915-855-9673. Bishop Brown's ministry of spiritual deliverance is well known in America and around the world. His message of freedom and victory in Christ is found in his best-selling books, Come by Word of Life Church for an autographed copy. Word of Life Church has a first-class children's ministry. Children also get to enjoy one of the largest indoor playgrounds in the city. Here at Word of Life Church, your teenagers will feel like they are a part of a group of youth that are truly committed to Christ. You won't find better music anywhere in El Paso than by our church band, as they play the latest music while incorporating the great classical hymns. Fellowship is important to us, so we have provided a relaxing atmosphere in our expanded coffee shop while you make new friends. 
Word of Life Church believes in helping those in need. Word of Life quietly helps provide food, clothing, and aid to the needy. Visit us at Word of Life Church and make a positive difference, not only in your own life, but the lives of others. Word of Life Church meets every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. for Spanish. Bible study is on Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. The church meets at 11675 Pratt Avenue. That's near the intersection of Pebble Hills and Saul Kleinfeld across from Walmart. For more information about this spirit-filled church, call us now 915-855-9673.